You're listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bit and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Kim Ruff. Kim is an Air Force veteran with more than six years of experience in proposal management. Kim is a proposal manager at Mythics and serves as vice president and membership chair for the APMP Liberty chapter. She's recognized by customers, peers, and the Association of Proposal Management Professionals for accomplishments to date and aspirations for future contributions to the proposal management profession. Kim is a recipient of the Charlie Devine APMP Certification Scholarship and APMP's 40 Under 40 Award. Welcome, Kim, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here um, and, and appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we're so excited to learn a little bit more about you. So as you know, we love to start in the beginnings. We're curious, where were you born? Where did you grow up and where did you go to school? Yeah, Um, so I was born in uh, Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, which is um, in an area southwest of Philadelphia, known to locals as Delco. It's it's in an area (laughs) called Delaware County, so we call it Delco. Um, And it's kind of funny because um, I was just reading an article uh, the other day Um, where they interviewed uh, Kate Winslet for the HBO series, Mayor of Easttown. I'm not sure um, if you guys have heard of that, but, um, Mm. and so apparently the accent in this area is considered to have one of the, um, or this area is considered to have one of the most difficult accents to um, imitate Mm. and one of the most studied. So in this article um, with Kate Winslet, they were talking about how she said that learning the Delco accent was um, second most difficult to a Russian accent that she actually (gasps) learned. (laughs) So (laughs) I thought this was really interesting um, and a a neat little fact about the area where I was born and grew up. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. so a little fun fact there about where I'm from. Um, So moving on to um, education. So I graduated high school um, from Interboro High School in 1995. And then a year later, I joined the Air Force in 1996. Um, so for that, you go through your basic training um, at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, and then technical training um, at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, and then from there, I started my journey. Once I got out of the Air Force, I started my journey towards uh, my bachelor's degree. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it, while I was in the Air Force, I met my husband. So w- when we both got out, we still like to move around a lot. We kind of mm-hmm. still had that military bug. So um, I completed my um, undergrad at, through several different schools. So through Penn State Brandywine, Auburn Montgomery, um, and then we finally settled in the Northern Virginia area. Um, and so I completed my undergrad at George Mason University. And then I also went on to get my um, Master of Fine Arts there in creative writing. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, what time period was that? Um, so that would have ranged... Um, the whole the whole journey of like um, being in the military in 1996, but then uh-huh. really getting into um, going back to school. So that would have ranged mm-hmm. from starting in like uh, 2008, but I finally finished um, in 2014. So when I was going to school, I was an adult learner. I had kids, I was married, um, you know, I was um, in my late 20s, early 30s. So mm-hmm. um, I was considered an adult learner at that point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, I thought we perhaps would have been at Mason um, pursuing master's classes at the same time, but I may have been there just a few years earlier. Than oh, me. okay. Yeah. I, so I graduated <laughs> from the MFA program in 2014, if that, yeah. that gives you better of a timeline. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I was just a, just a few years before you, but that's super cool. Yeah. Oh, really neat. <laughs> Um, so from all of that coursework, um, were you working at the same time as an adult learner or were you um, just focused on going to school and family? Kind of how, how was that playing out? Yeah. So when I was going um, back to school and the other, uh, like through Penn State and Auburn and things like that, I was working as a government contractor. Um, so, but when I went back to school at George Mason, I went back like full time. Um, and, and that was like, you know, stay at home, mom, full-time student. Um, but when I got into my MFA program, um, I was selected into, um, the, uh, program there where they allow you to teach while you're going to school. So, um, yeah, so I was teaching while I was in the MFA program, taking my classes full-time, 
uh, stay at home mom. And then actually I'm not, so since you went to George Mason, you're probably familiar with um, the fall for the book. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So I was the assistant manager for that as well. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. I, I just piled it all on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And I look back and I'm like, how did I do that? I, I can't even imagine. I don't know how I did it. Um, but I just know I, I enjoyed it and it was a lot of fun and a lot of, uh, great experiences and, um, really enjoyed my time, especially with fall for the book. That was a lot of fun working with Kara Oakleaf. Um, and then also with all the, um, you know, all the authors and, and all the other volunteers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think someone was, it was a different person was in charge of fall for the book when I was there. It was a, a gentleman. So interesting oh, how things evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it was Bill Miller probably. And then, and then Kara came in and, and helped him out. I, I mean, I don't know, but yeah, it might've been yeah. him. Yeah, I think I was there at a, at a time where uh, a lot of the previous professors were um, gearing towards retirement. So oh, okay. you know, a lot of fresh faces soon after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned, you know, kind of government contracting. Is that kind of where you migrated to after the Air Force, kind of your first job outside of the Air Force? Yeah, yeah, that was definitely my first job outside of the Air Force. Well, um, I mean, I went, actually, I started back in, um, went to the mall first <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and got a job at the mall as an assistant manager in American Eagle. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to be honest, the experience um, with having the military experience helped me because I didn't have any experience in, in being an assistant manager um, for retail, a retail store. Um, but they were like, oh, you, you must have great work ethic. You were in the military. I'm like, I, I do, but you know, but that's, but so it was interesting. So I did get a, a job at the mall for about a year and then, um, you know, living in the, that area, but that was um, in Montgomery, Alabama. So there's mm-hmm. Gunter Air Force Base there. And um, my husband and I made a lot of friends um, there that were in the military and there happened to be an opening um, on the base there at Gunter. So there was an opportunity um, and it just seemed like a natural transition to become a government contractor. Um, you know, I knew the lingo. I felt very comfortable um, in that environment. So, yeah, so that's pretty much was my first real job outside of the military. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. So kind of from there, how did you enter the proposal world then? Um, yeah, so I was um, teaching, well, my, then my husband and I moved to South Carolina after I graduated from my MFA program. Um, and, um, as I mentioned, I was, um, teaching during my graduate program. And then after that, I started, um, you know, becoming an instructor of English composition, um, and those intro introductory courses. Um, so we moved to South Carolina, my husband's from South Carolina. So we moved, uh, to be closer to his family and I started teaching at a local college, um, there, Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just not reliable, like adjunct, um, instructors, Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's just not reliable. And I had kids, I had a family, um, you know, I wanted to be able to support, uh, contribute financially to the family. And then also thinking about my husband and I potentially retiring one day and, you know, all those Mm -hmm. thoughts were going through my head. I said, I need something more consistent, more reliable benefits, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so there was a, um, technical writer position, Uh, for a company in North Charleston. And um, I applied and, um, and that was in 2015. Um, Mm -hmm. And I realized almost immediately on the first day on the job, I'm like, this is not technical writing. I don't know what this is, but this is not (laughs) what I had in mind for technical writing. So it was really proposal management is what the job really Uh, was, but they labeled it as technical writing. So obviously Mm -hmm. I had never heard of that before. um, But I mean, I hit the ground running um, and Mm. I just loved it. And within two months of being on the job, I managed 10 proposals at one time. (gasps) Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was, it was really cool. So like, that was the moment that like, I knew that I'm like, this is, this is my thing. Like, this is my sweet spot. This is like, I can see me doing this as a career, which I would have never have thought of because I never even heard of proposal management. Um, Yeah. But yeah, that's how I came, I came into it. I, I needed something more reliable, found this technical writer job and said, okay, I, I can do that. I have a writing background and, um, and yeah, but it turned into actual proposal management. Obviously there's some writing elements around that, but it was really proposal 
management and I just loved it. Yeah. That's so cool. What an interesting way to fall into it. Just kind of <laughs> tricked by the job title, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so can you tell us a little bit about where your career has progressed from there? Um, it sounds like there's been some moves, you know, geographically as well in there. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> um, as I said, we do like to move around. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, my husband and I ended up moving back to Pennsylvania in 2016. And that's where I'm from. My whole family's here. So we're close to my family, my side of the family. Um, and um, I started working for um, a company uh, called Mythics Incorporated, and they are based out of uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And mm -hmm. their workforce is a remote workforce. The majority of their workforce is a remote workforce. They, they do have an office in Virginia Beach. That's where our headquarters are. Um, so um, I, I became a proposal manager for them. Um, and I've been with them now for four years. So I've been in an industry a total of six years and I've been with um, uh, Mythics Incorporated for four years now as a proposal manager. Awesome. And so over the years, I'm sure there are a couple of proposals that stand out. Um, is there one or two you could share with us? Um, yeah, it's, it's funny because I um, was thinking about this and, um, you know, I support federal, state and local government. Um, higher ed, healthcare communities. So I, I support the gamut of the industries. And mm -hmm. um, I've managed a lot of proposals over the years, but I think like I keep on going back uh, to those first 10 that I managed in that short mm -hmm. period of time when I first took on this role. Um, mm -hmm. Because I felt like they showed me that proposal management was my professional sweet spot in life because I definitely thought it was always going to be teaching. Um, mm. I mean, since I was in first grade, I, I'm telling you, like, I still have the documents or not the documents, but the paperwork where uh -huh. I do pictures of myself as a teacher with hearts and rainbows, um, <laughs> I, I knew what my classroom was going to look like. Um, and I talked about the kind of teacher I would be and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm still very passionate about teaching, about teaching, like at my core. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think it does come back to those first 10 proposals because, um, like, you know, I heard your reaction, you're like, wow, 10 proposals, like in the first, like three months of being in this job. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just really like, I just, that's kind of when I fell in love with what I'm doing now with my career and I kind of found my niche. And so that kind of brings everything together for you in life. Right. Cause you kind of go through life and you go through these different processes. Like I always knew that I loved writing. Right. And I always knew that I loved teaching and, um, and then I was in the military. So I had all these different backgrounds. Um, and even when I was in the military, I was sort of doing stuff that was that aligned with proposal management. And so mm -hmm. everything I I've done, um, to that point, you know, when I became a proposal manager, just, just all just came together in that moment. And, um, it was just like, this is, this is really cool. This is a really cool moment for me that, that I feel like I just found my career. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That would yeah. make those, those efforts memorable for sure. Right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Somewhere along the way, you discovered APMP. Can you tell us about kind of your first experiences and how you became involved? Yeah, so um, I joined APMP in um, August of 2015, um, and I started out in the Carolina chapter because we were living in South Carolina at the time. Um, and then when I moved to Pennsylvania, I became a member of the Liberty chapter. Um, but what I remember initially about joining or finding out about APMP is that the people that I worked with at my first job knew, like it was, everybody knew Kim, Kim loves a proposal management. She's very passionate about it. And um, I was in a conversation one day um, with somebody at work and they're, they're like, you know, there's a professional organization for people like you. <laughs> 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 and I, I was like, I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> um, but of course now I'm like, oh, I get it. We are a quirky bunch. Like if you love this profession, um, you know, th th you either love it or hate it. And, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, so we're a quirky little bunch, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I came to know about APMP and, and join that. And then um, one other memory, early memory that I have um, uh, 
it was a coworker of mine had already been a member of APMP. And she's like, oh, there's this great conference. Um, it's called SPAC. And do you want to go? It's all about proposals. And I'm like, okay, sure. Why not? Conferences, you know, it's a professional conference. It'll be a great opportunity to network, meet people and learn more, you know, about the industry because I was literally just starting out. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I, I met Ginny Carson there. So it was actually ah. the um, Southern Proposal Accents Conference. And um, I mean, what better person to meet than Ginny Carson, right? Like full of energy, <laughs> so positive about the industry. But um, it was really great because what she did, she knew that I was a newbie. Like, um, you know, my coworker introduced me. Oh, Kim just got involved in the industry. She just started. But she, at, at the conference, and she was presenting at the conference, I think maybe even getting ready pre to present at the next in the next hour. She like mm -hmm. took the time to talk with me about the profession, um, the different roles from capture to pro proposal management to pricing. Um, and then, you know, she just had this positive energy um, about our industry. And it just really like, um, you know, validated like my excitement around like what I'm doing and, and how I felt about what I've kind of fell into, right, as a proposal manager. Um, so that's definitely a memory that stuck with me. Um, meeting Jenny Carson at that conference just like kind of validated for me, like, oh, this is, this is fun. Like this is, this is a cool industry to be in. This is, you know, this is something. Oh yeah, absolutely. It sounds like a really great first conference experience for sure. Particularly, you know, meeting someone that energetic and just, you know, solidifying it for you. It's a great absolutely. Story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, APMP 40 under 40 and winning that award and kind of what that meant for you? Yeah. So um, I think it's a great opportunity that they do that. I know I hear people joke like, hey, what about APMP 50 under 50? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, you know, they, they have you write an essay, you know, you have to talk about your experience. Um, and then like, what do you think you're going to provide like for the future of proposal management? And like, or where do you see yourself? And, you know, obviously why you deserve to be awarded 40 under 40. I think for me, um, because I was so late in the game in finding this career, um, so when I applied for that 40 under 40, um, award, I was 39 years old. Mm. So of course I use that as a differentiator, or I don't know how you would say it, but like a, um, you know, as a proof point, like, Hey, if I don't get it this year, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, I just thought it was a great opportunity to really think about, um, you know, well, why do I enjoy what I do and why is it? important to me. And, and I'm thinking about it from a career perspective, like, you know, why do I want to continue do, doing this as a career? Why do I see this as a career? And um, I think that was a really great opportunity for me to kind of take a step back and, and write those thoughts out and, and go through those thoughts and think about where I came from. Because at 39 years old, I obviously had a long path before that, right? And um, all the different experiences and everything that I had been through, um, you know, when I talk to people, they're like, wow, you were in the military and wow, you did that. And, you know, I, I don't think about that stuff because it's just what I did, right? You just kind of mm -hmm. go through the motions and, you, you know, day by day, you're, you're doing things um, and you don't realize like the impact they might have on others or on yourself. So I think that APMP 40 under 40, applying for that award really made me take a step back and stop and think about my journey to that, to that point, because you kind of had to talk about that too. And, um, and I thought that was a great opportunity for me to kind of recognize where I've been, how far I've come, what I've accomplished. And, um, you know, cause I don't know if we, if, if any of us give ourselves enough credit for all the hard work mm. that we've done and, and where it's taken us, um, you know, and how hard we ha we've had to work to get where we are. So I think that made me stop and, and, and think about like, you know, why do I think I deserve this? Um, and, and tell that story. Yeah, absolutely. It must have been really fun reflecting on that because you have had such an interesting journey and done so many things to kind of prep you and prepare you for finally finding this great profession. So, yeah, yeah, awesome. it was it was a great experience. And and I obviously kept the um, I, I'll call it an essay. I, I kept the essay because I like to look back on it and um, and even like refine it as I go along. But just look back on it and remind me like, 
you know, hey, like you're doing, you're doing good. Like it's okay. Like you're, you know, you're doing good. You're, you know, you're moving ahead. Like you're, you're making, um, you know, you're making strides uh, towards the future in in your career, and and then also, you know, for the industry itself. So, um, it's it's good to look back at that. Uh, absolutely. Wow. So you have had, you know, such a cool career and it's been super interesting learning about it. We're going to transition into our nutters round in just a minute. Um, but before that, can you tell us three things that not many people know about you? Sure. Um, so one thing, which is a lot of fun, um, is that I used to be a performance storyteller in the Washington, D.C. area when I lived in Northern Virginia with a company yeah. called Better Said Than Done. And um, so we used to, um, you know, you would write a a true story, nonfiction story, and then you would memorize it and you would get up and perform it um, in front of an audience. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't think most people know that about me. Mm -hmm. Um, I also played keyboard in two bands for a very short time. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget the one band name, but the other one, uh, we called ourselves Papa Smell because... (laughs) There was a guy in the band, his name was Papa Smo. So we thought that was cool. So um, <laughs> we called ourselves Papa Sm- Smo and we played songs like um, Bon Jovi's Runaway or um, Bruce Springsteen's Rosalita, whatever would get the audience up and dancing. So that was fun. Um, um, and then the last thing is I have three tattoos. Oh, wow. What are your tattoos of? Um, well, the first one um, I got <laughs> when I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day when nobody cared about anything, my, my, I said to my brother, I have, I have two older brothers, and I said, I, I really want to get a tattoo. And um, he said, all right. So we, uh, I don't remember if we took the train or I don't think he, yeah, he must have been driving. Maybe we drove down there, but it was on South Street in Philadelphia, right off of South Street, 4th and South. Um, and uh, I got a tattoo of a butterfly with a face in it. So it's, it's a butterfly <laughs> literally with a woman's lips and eyes and a, and a mole. And um, it's pretty cool. So I have a cool story about that, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And then, <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I got my second tattoo in Northern Virginia and it's a, a Celtic heart with all my kids' names around it Aww. and um, four, four kids total. And, um, and then while I was getting that tattoo, I said to the tattoo artist, hey, do you, do you think you could, um, you know, sharpen up my other tattoo that I got? I, I got it when I was 14, you know, we're talking about maybe 30 years later, 20 years later, I'm trying to get this other tattoo refreshed and she wouldn't touch it. She said it was an antique. She knew exactly where I got it. She knew the exact artist who gave it to me. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> I found that really interesting. And I was really happy to report that to my dad after all these years that it was totally worth me getting that first tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he laughs about that. I'm like, dad, it's an antique, see? <laughs> but, um, and then my last tattoo I have is um, of wildflowers with a hummingbird. I got that in honor of um, my stepmom who passed away last June, um, not from COVID or anything. Um, she was battling, um, uh, ovarian cancer. Um, and so she passed away from that last June. So that was really tough. Um, she's been, she was in my life for 20 years. So, um, and you know, with COVID happening during that time, I didn't get the chance to really see her because obviously like when you're going through chemo and stuff, they already, the people going through that have a low immune system. So, you know, you want to try and stay away from them to keep them in their best health. So it was COVID on top of her going through chemo treatment. So we've really barely got to see her. So that was really rough. Um, But that's my last tattoo. So I got that in honor of her. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but a sweet memory of her. Yeah, it definitely. Every, it's, it's right on my forearm. So she's always with me right there. I can see her. Oh, that's yeah. so, so sweet. Yeah. Oh, so Basker, we're on to kind of more of Kim's hobbies and interests and then the, the nutters round. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think... Uh... <laughs> I'm already very curious about the game. <laughs> Nervous about the, the rapid fire round. <laughs> we, will, we will settle you slowly, Kim. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. So, thank you, Ashley. Thanks for this. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we did touch a little bit about uh, three things not many people know about you. Kim, talk us through about your hobbies and interests as well. Yeah, so hobbies, um, you know, they've shifted as of late because of COVID. 
Um, but I, I, there was a um, trend going around where people develop pods of friends, um, you know, so that's kind of what my husband and I did. We, we have um, what we call our pods. So um, the group of people that we consistently hung out with over the last year. Um, so, you know, that's kind of just what we did, like gathering with our friends at each other's houses, um, you know, and, um, and most recently, now that things are starting to pick back up, Again, my, my kids are getting more involved in their sports um, or wanting to go hang out with their friends. Um, you know, that now they're, my daughter, you know, she's a teenager, she wants to go shopping. So we're, we're slowly getting back into kind of the normal parts of that. Um, and then also um, we love going to the beach um, in Seattle City, New Jersey. That's kind of our family's happy place. So we're really looking forward to that because it just breaks up the monotony of, you know, just everything that's been happening, it, it makes you kind of feel like, um, you know, it's just something to look forward to. So the kids are really excited about that. So uh, we call it going down the shore. And so we're looking forward to doing that. Nice, nice. Also, you did mention about music. Um, yeah. So would you like to share a little bit more about your music? Sure. Yeah. Love music. Music is a big deal in my family. A lot of musicians in my family and um, so just grew up with it. Um, my grandparents were um, taught Irish dancing. They, you know, always had music. Um, either they were playing music at their house or they just always had it on. Um, and then um, when I was 14, I got a job um, at a steak and hoagie shop in the local area. And the owner of it, it was a mom and pop shop. So the owner always had like the oldies on. So I grew up with like a lot of uh, exposure to a lot of different types of music, everything from like jazz to classic rock, um, love Spanish music. Um, I just, you know, just got a great beat to it. Uh, but I also love like the doo doo wop and I like 90s alternative and pop. Um, and I think what's really fun for me is um, I learn a lot about artists that like I might not have never known from my kids. Um, like little, I, I'm, I'm saying that they're going to like, what did you say that for? Lil Peep, <laughs> you can't say little, it's Lil Peep and um, XXX Temptation. Um, so I learn a lot from my kids too. And um, I think that's really cool because I know a lot of parents have a hard time connecting to their kids' music. Um, and I'm not saying that I love all their music, but I do enjoy, um, you know, listening to what they're listening to. Um, uh, but I do learn a lot from them. But yeah, love all sorts of music. Nice, nice. So what's, uh, what's your favorite, listening to music or singing or dancing? <laughs> um, all of it at the same time <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I'm, I'm a karaoke junkie I love karaoke um, I actually have a wireless microphone for parties so you can connect it to like um, any of those like wireless music uh, speakers and it's so much fun every everybody knows um, they're like put the microphone away somebody hide it <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice game so which 80s or 90s pop group or, or song that you really like Oh, so 90s, um, well, I don't, um, I'm trying to think. So 90s pop, like there's a lot of music that's just fun that I'm trying to think of. Like, um, I feel like, and I get lost in the decades because I'm like, to me, it all kind of meshes together. I, after the 90s, I kind of get lost. But mm -hmm. um, like, uh, what's going on? I'm trying to think of, of the Four Non Blondes. Um, that's a fun song. Uh, but for the 90s music, my favorite is like alternative. So like um, Nirvana, um, Pearl Jam, you know, that type of music. Um, I, I enjoy that. Stone Temple Pilots, all, all those types of groups. They were my favorite. Nice. Okay, Kim. So let's officially move into the Nutters Round in honor of Howard Nut. What we used to call the Rapid Random Fire Questions Round. So... What was your favorite toy when you were a kid? Probably, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I'm trying to think what kind of toys I had as a kid. <laughs> Probably anything that like my brothers had. So like we like to play a lot of sports. So like a hockey stick or, um, okay, uh, now I'm thinking of one. So I do remember one birthday, I got these like um, rings that you can hang from that you would put on a play set and they were Donald Duck rings. And my dad hung them on the playset that we had in the backyard and you could hang from them and, and like swing and 
and do a lot of like different like gymnastic kind of stuff from it. And so probably that those were my most memorable. Nice. So if you could be an Olympic athlete in what sport would you compete and why? Okay. I love that you asked this question because I have to tell you, I am obsessed with curling. I would, I would do curling a hundred percent all day. Like I actually considered joining a curling team uh-huh. <laughs> recently. Um, and my, my husband's like, don't you think you have enough going on? But, um, cause I do do a lot, but yes, curling number one, hands down. Oh, nice. Nice. Definitely. You should consider joining the club. I, <laughs> I can have. I'll speak to your husband. <laughs> well, look, I watched I watched them recently because they had a whole curling event and those guys get pretty low. And I'm like, that would maybe be my only problem. I don't know if I can get that low. <laughs> ah, no, that's, yeah, that's so true, actually. Have you ever sent a text message to the wrong person? Um, yes. Yep. And I think it might have only happened once because you learn pretty quickly. Um and I think it, I think I might've been complaining about somebody and sent it to them thinking I was maybe sending it to my mom or something. <laughs> so yeah, I think I might've only done that once. Perfect. Big you snap are plan- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You're planning the most awesome dinner party of your life. Which three celebrities or historical figures past or present would you add to your guest list? And what do you talk to them and what food will you cook for them? So it's a kind of a three questions, guests, yeah. food, and talk. Okay. This is something I also talk about a lot. Um, kind of like my, like if I had a chance to have a party, right? Like you're saying. Um, yeah. So this is also another great question. So I always say that I would love, love to have a party with Snoop Dogg. Mm-hmm. Um, because he just seems like a cool dude to hang out with, like love his music, love his attitude towards life. Um, you know, he just seems like a cool dude. And then I would have Martha Stewart cater it because the two of them are really good friends. I'm not sure if you know that, um, but the two of them are really good friends. So I would love to have Martha Stewart there to cater it, have Snoop Dogg to hang out with. And then a third person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think my third person, it's a toss up. Um, it would either have to be Jimmy Fallon because he's also hilarious, love his view on life. You know, he'd really love, he likes to keep it light. Um, and I just, it's just so fun. Like when I watch his show, I'm like, I just want to be this guy's friend. Like he looks like he'd be like a great friend to have. So he would either be my third person or, um, Anthony Bourdain was a huge fan of a fan of his. So obviously, um, I, I would love to hang out with him. Um, and then also, uh, you know, maybe taste some of his, his dishes as well. Um, so I would love to have that experience. So either Jimmy Fallon or Anthony Bourdain, that would be a toss up for my third person, but definitely Snoop Dogg and, uh, Martha Stewart. Um, and then what would I talk to them about? Was that your other question? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, um, I, you know what? I, um, I, I don't know, like maybe and I hope it doesn't sound too morbid, but maybe if I was talking to Anthony Bourdain, I would ask him like, Hey, like, what's the secret to life? Like, you know, um, any, any tips, trades, of the, you know, like what, what would you want me to know about life? Um, you know, not to take it for granted and things like that, of course, but like, you know, um, and I, but Jimmy Fallon, I, I, I don't know. I think I would just like to hang out with them and just maybe not talk to them about anything in particular, just like the, conversation happen naturally got it got it got it yes what's the weirdest thing you have ever eaten um i've eaten a, a worm uh-huh. um so, <laughs> so when i was stationed um in south korea in the military mm-hmm. um a friend asked me or dared me to eat um so when you would walk around downtown they would have these um i guess the best way to describe them would be meal carts and they would have different options. It, it's, it's a small little cart and the person pushes it around uh, to try and sell the food. And um, they had these flat looking b- brown worms. That's the best way I can describe them. But in this sauce and um, a friend of mine dared me to eat one. So I did. That is the weirdest thing I've ever eaten. And did you like it? Um, I th- think I held my nose. 
I, I don't even think I chewed. I think I just swallowed just so I could say I did it. Um, so I would definitely say I did not like it. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. So what will you do if you have a time machine? Oh man, time machine. That's, that's a tricky question. Cause you could either go back or go forward. Mm. Um, oh geez. I, I think if I had a time machine, I would probably go back to when I was in the military and complete all of my um, degrees while I was in the military. So I would get my bachelor's degree while I was in the military, my master's degree, because the military pays for it. Um, and I did not take advantage of that um, while I was in the military. Although I did get the GI Bill when I got out, it still wasn't enough to cover an undergraduate degree plus a master's degree. So that's probably what I would do. Nice. So if you could eat only three foods for the rest of your life, which three food will you choose? Yeah, great question. Chocolate definitely um, has to be on that list. Um, chocolate, oh geez. Um, Mexican food. So if I can be generic and just say Mexican food, all types of Mexican food. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Chocolate number one, Mexican food. And then um, I think... Um, I think like maybe just gelati. I love gelati. <laughs> Chocolate, gelati, Mexican. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unique combination. Unique combination. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot about you. Nice. Kim, do you have any nicknames? Um, I don't. No, no. I, I, well, I, I should say my, my 10 year old son, um, mm. he calls me momster, M-O-M-S-T-E-R, momster. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I start to get upset with the kids or whatever, he, he's, he's very comical, loves to joke around, always very lighthearted. Um, and which is great because, you know, when parents get upset, it's good to have that kid that can kind of break the ice and, and, you know, kind of make you calm down and realize it's not that big of a deal, but, um, he's, he's the one. Yeah. He, he coined me as momster when I, when I get angry at the kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name. Momster. Yeah, it's cute. Definitely. Definitely. What's on your bucket list? Hmm. I think on my bucket list is to travel more. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm looking forward to retirement. Um, and hopefully the kids are all happy and, and they're settled in their lives. Um, and, you know, hopefully everything goes as my husband and I are planning it. Um, you know, hopefully the kids are happy, settled in their lives. And then when we retire, we can travel and, and, and you know, and, and go back to like when we, the single days, you know, when we could do whatever we want. So um, keeping my fingers crossed for that, that's, that's on the bucket list is travel more. Definitely. Is there any particular place you would like to travel as a first option? As a first option? Um, I think, um, I, I mean, Ireland, I have a, um, I love Ireland. I love visiting there. Um, that's where my ancestors are from. So anytime I would, you know, to go back there, but like, we've been there a couple of times. So um, other than that, I, I think what would be really cool is to take, um, do a scenic American trip and see all the sites in America, um, you know, like the Grand Canyon, um, places like that, that, you know, um, Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, um, you know, those types of places that are right here in the United States, and I haven't seen them yet. And so that would be fun to take a road trip across the United States and see all those places like Mount Rushmore and stuff like that. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Perfect. So the last question in this round is what's something that you have that's of sentimental value to you? Oh, oh my gosh. So, so many things. Um, I'm, I am very sentimental and everybody in my family knows that. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, when my grandparents passed um, and they were cleaning out the house, they're like, don't, don't let Kimberly come because she's going to want to keep everything. <laughs> um, I'm very sentimental. Um, so I have a lot of stuff. I have um, old films um, that my grandparents took when my parents were kids. I have um, my, my grandfather's old Irish cap. I have, um, you know, a lot of stuff probably from my grandparents is what I'll say. So to generalize it, I do have a lot of mementos from my grandparents. I have old cameras. I have pictures I have dishes um things like that a typewriter which is really really cool um from the 1800s so it's pretty awesome um 
Yeah. So I, I do like to keep that, but I've learned over the years, I can't keep everything. So I do try to minimize it mm. as much as possible. Got it. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Thank you, Kim. So that's officially closed our Nutters round. Hope you enjoyed okay. it. Yeah, um, I did. It was great. Great questions. <laughs> Let's move into people in your life. So who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Yeah. So to piggyback off of what I was just talking about, uh, being sentimental and my grandparents. So um, in my life and for my career, I'd have to say that um, both my maternal and paternal grandparents were the most influential. Um, they're all past now, but um, because my experiences with them, I feel provided me um, like the foundation, the core for my personal values and work ethic that I carry to this day. I spent a lot of time with them uh, during the week and on weekends growing up. Um, and I even lived with my father's parents for a time, but all of my grandparents um, taught me through their own actions, you know, to always go the extra mile, to show up early, put your best foot forward, um, take responsibility for your actions, stay humble, help others. But the most important lesson they told me is to not take life too seriously, make sure to have fun and laugh with the ones that you love. And how about your career? Um... Yeah, in my career, um, I, I like, yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. I think like they, they are like the foundation for who I am today. So in my life and for my career now, for my career specifically, it's, um, I feel like it's, it's everybody like in, in this industry, in this proposal, APMP industry, um, you know, that having that professional organization really provided an opportunity to have my hand held through things I didn't know. And I think what's really great about the organization is the people and how um, welcoming they are. And it's not like, I don't feel like ever there's any kind of competition. I feel like I can go ask anybody any question and they're not gonna look at me like I have three heads. Like I should know this kind of stuff because I've been in, an in, in the industry for three or six years. So I think really it, it's just like, the whole network of, um, and, and mostly the people I know through the APMP organization. So I would have to say anybody affiliated um, with APMP, that's who I would um, credit like um, as influential in my career. You know, I mean, um, like I mentioned, Jenny Carson, I, um, you know, uh, met BJ Lowney, um, th the people um, that I work with um, as a part of the board of Liberty chapter, like, you know, it's, it's a very supportive environment. And I don't think you find that um, in, in many places. And so I'm very grateful for that. And I think that is a huge influence on feeling comfortable enough to develop myself professionally, because I don't feel scared to ask questions because again, nobody makes you feel like, wow, that was a really stupid question. Everybody's like, oh yeah. So here's my experience with that. Or here's, you know, maybe how I would handle that. So that's nice. That's nice, Kim. I know you're so blessed with people around you. This is amazing. Yeah. Kim, as you know, for the past one year, we have been going through COVID and, and all the uncertainties and hard times. So what have you observed lately that reminded you that people are kind? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great point. And, and, and yeah, and to kind of keep in that mindset, like, I, I don't, like, I don't think there's any one thing I think it's a culmination of things, right? So in the, like you said, in the last year, we saw people coming together to help each other. Um, and some of the most touching moments for me were like the small moments, like people making dozens of masks for complete strangers and handing them out or leaving them on their front porch, like, and, and socializing about it on social media, right? Like, hey, my neighbor just made a hundred masks. If, if you need one, come to her front porch. Here's the address, you know, feel free to like all those types of things. Um, they're handing them out to anyone in need, people organizing, like trying to keep people's spirits up. So they're organizing drive-by birthdays or graduations or any other kind of celebration. Um, I thought one thing that was really um, touching also was uh, people buying food um, for frontline workers or food trucks and restaurants donating free food to the frontline workers um, or people who donated to food banks or were able to volunteer at them. So I think it was the culmination of all those little things um, coming together, like, you know, 
that really, and I was really happy to see when that kind of stuff was reported on the news or through social media, because I think we absolutely needed that over the last year. 100%, 100%, Kim. So uh, who is the kindest person you know? Um, so I think this might be sort of the same kind of answer where I mean, like, it's not just one person because there has been so much as of late that has happened. You're really seeing like all walks of life of kindness. Um, so I think for me, um, yeah, I would like to recognize like all school staff. So, um, you know, guidance counselors, teachers, because obviously this past year was chaos for students in K through 12, probably for college students too, um, but I don't have that firsthand knowledge. I don't have any um, kids in college. Um, but the school staff at my kids, um, I have one in elementary school and one in high school. Um, they just made themselves available. They were beyond patient and empathetic to students and parents. Um, and you know, during the whole process of virtual schooling and then now during the process of students coming back to school, I mean, I just felt like they were just completely open, very flexible, um, and, and especially empathetic. Like, I, I never felt like there was a, a rigid, like, well, no, you, you have to do this or you have to do that. It was like, okay, what, what are your needs? Mm -hmm. And I mean, Justin, I think my, my son's uh, fourth grade class, there's 300 kids just for one class or excuse me, one grade. Right. So imagine them doing that however many times over for the whole K through 12 system. Like, you know what I mean? So I think that that says a lot about who, who they are, um, you know, and, and how they stepped up in these tough times. Definitely, definitely, Kim. Kim, what's one personal trait you like the most about yourself? Um, I, th I think, um, oh, it's a tough one. <laughs> Um, I, I think that I, that I have heeded my grandparents, um, you know, recommendation and not take life too seriously. I, I think that's one thing I, I do like about myself is that I do try to laugh. I do try to have fun. Um, you know, cause it's so easy to kind of throw in the towel and, and, and be upset about things, but I, 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 I'm upset when it's necessary to be upset or, or whatever it might be or sad when it's us, but I, but I do try to um, keep things light. So I think that's what I like about myself, but I absolutely recognize, you know, when a situation is serious and, and it needs serious attention and things like that. But um, for the most part, I do try to keep things light, especially with others and try to make them feel welcome and, um, you know, always try to let them know that I'm there for them. Nice. What's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? I think the one thing um, that I wish I had known is about, like, obviously about APMP um, and that organ and and the organization. Um, so I, I guess, like, because I thought I was going to be an English professor, and then I realized like that wasn't going to work for me. Like, I, I mean, I was dead set. Like I said, since first grade, I'm I'm going to teach. Um, I'm going to be a teacher. Um, and then as I progressed, I thought, okay, now I want to be an English professor. And so that was my new goal. Um, and then I realized it's not going to work for me. It's really competitive. There's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. Um, and in order to get to those through, get to those hoops, it's not, you know, a reliable and consistent schedule um, and um, benefits and all that kind of good stuff. But I guess I wish someone would have told me, hey, you know, you have all these different skills. Um, what about proposal management and APMP uh, sooner? Um, you know, I wish I would have known about that sooner. Um, and I think also that I wish the company that initially hired me for that technical writer position, I wish they knew more about the bid and proposal profession. And I think companies are now I'm seeing it um, become you know, more well-recognized throughout um, the profession uh, that companies are, you know, looking at APMP and the fact that they even know about certifications through APMP says something because I think the company that hired me initially didn't really understand what that role meant and what that was um, because I felt like if they did, they might have known about APMP, they would have had proper training process and I would have had more awareness about the expectations about that role. Nice, Kim. Definitely. I think in hindsight, definitely. You know, I think they, as they always say, um, what you know 
what you would have done in the past 10 years. Oh, of course. If you have known that you could have done it in one year and yeah. maybe the next 10 years, you could have done it in one month and so, right? But, you know, that's part of the learning and that's, that's life. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in a successful career, lovely people around you, beautiful family, APMP Liberty chapter. What's next for you, Kim? What are you looking forward to in the future? Um, yeah, so I think um, there's two perspectives, like my professional and my personal. So from a, from a personal perspective, um, and definitely more long term, uh, just supporting my kids through their journey right now, my focus is going to be on the kids. Um, uh, we have a 23 year old, a 15 year old and a 10 year old, um, and they each have different goals. Um, and my husband and I want to support them the best we can in meeting those goals. And then, you know, as I brought up earlier, when they're all hopefully happy, healthy, settled in their own lives, um, my husband and I look forward to our retirement and traveling um, because we do love to travel. Um, the fact that we've been living where we live now um, in the area outside of Philadelphia, we've been here for five years this May. That's unheard of. My family is like, are you sure? Like, are you really staying? Like, so, um, I mean, people have pages in their address book with like our addresses crossed out. And, you know, so um, I think we'll get the travel bug back in us. And um, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, destinations like St. Croix, Italy, New Zealand, um, Scotland, possibly Australia. I know that's a little bit of a hike, um, but, you know, just really looking forward to getting out. Um, and then from a professional perspective, um, I, want, I want to start, um, I think, I want, well, I, I was going to say maybe more immediately, um, I want to start communicating with the local colleges and universities about APMP's intentional career path concepts. So, um, you know, I have certain goals for where I'm at with my company, um, but as far as like giving back to the um, profession, um, I, I really want to um, look at those concepts that the uh, Intentional Career Path Committee has put out there. Um, and I've actually started using them because at my company, we are um, hosting a virtual career day for local high school juniors and seniors to kind of introduce them to like a day in the life of the different roles at our IT company. And um, I'm using some of that Intentional Career Path, those, those concepts that they provided. And um, so I'm excited about that. But I my goal professionally um, is to start communicating with those local colleges and universities about APMP and put that awareness out there around our profession. Perfect, Kim. I think that's a great initiative, great initiative. I think uh, over this three, four months, I think, uh, you know, there were a few uh, graduates from universities who also leveraged our platform. So if you if you have any graduate or anyone, we can give free access to all the proposal tools, templates, trainings, not even. Oh, great. Working, yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Yeah. The part of the intentional career path with Christine, I think we are exploring since we have all the online tools, it wouldn't take uh, a lot of cost for us. It's just incremental login access and so on. So which we could manage. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it shouldn't stop anybody who is interested to study, to pursue learning. Uh, that's because education is very close to my heart. So let me know. Oh, I good. Can. Yeah. Yeah. So we're on the same page with that. I, I agree. Education is very close to my heart as well. Nice, Kim. So uh, Kim, uh, we are at the end of the episode. Is there any part of your life or career that we have missed? Or is there anything else you would like to share to our listeners before we close the episode? Um, no, I don't think so. I think I think we covered a lot, and it was it was great to um, talk with both you and Ashley. And this was so much fun. And again, I just appreciate the opportunity um, to share my thoughts with everybody. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much. It's been an absolute privilege to have you, Kim, and wish you, your family, and everybody at Liberty, and also your colleagues at work, all the good health and happiness. Please continue to inspire not just bid and proposal colleagues, but all your family members, Ireland, anybody whom you touch, Kim. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Sindrum. Signing off.